first of all, thanks everybody for coming. Um, my name is Evan. I'm a de Rust developer at Fiberplane. My name is Benno. I've been here, uh, here at Fiberplane since its inception. And in this talk, we're going to talk about our experience using the Axum web framework. So we were using another framework and then switched to using Axum. In this talk, we'll talk a little bit about what Axum is like, what it was like to switch, and then things we like and don't like. So kind of a teal or like overview of our experience using it and some things you might want to think about when picking a Rust web framework. Um, yeah, a couple of years ago, uh, we set out to create Fireplane, but yeah, of course, first question is what language are you going to use? Obviously, it's going to be Rust because it's a Rust meetup. Um, so yeah, what, what are the reasons for picking Rust? Yeah, safety, um, uh, type safe, uh, all that stuff. Um, <laughs> it's speed, uh, it's fast. Um, we already knew we wanted to do something with WASM, um, so we were already prepared for that as well, but I don't know. It's, it's just a cool technology, so we just like using it. Uh, so yeah, then came the next question, are we gonna go async or not? Um, obviously we want to go async, and at the time, Tokyo seemed to be like the most popular uh, framework out there. So we, we decided early on, like, hey, we're going to use Fre uh, Tokyo. Um, a lot of uh, third party um, uh, crates were al already had support for it. And uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Camera shine. Go ahead. Go ahead. No <laughs> pictures. <Good time>. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. All right, where was oh, yeah. Async. So, yeah. But then after that came the question, like, well, which web framework are you going to use? So we, we went through a couple, like one of the highlight or low light, whatever way you want to say it was um, Warp. We, we tried it out for a bit, but um, yeah, it's, it's built on Tokyo and Hyper, so that's good. It has um, support for WebSockets, um, which is something as a collaborative yeah, tool, it's very useful to have. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's quite difficult to understand in my uh, in my opinion, um, like, and if, if something were to go wrong, yeah, you're in a world of hurt. I think you. Yeah, I I used it as at a previous company, and Warp uses this filter model where you filter the requests through this chain of nested filters, and you get some very weird errors. Like if a request doesn't match something, it ends up in just a different place. And so when you would expect to get like a 404 error, you might get a 405 method not allowed. And you're just like, what, why? And it's because it ended up somewhere else in your logic. So I was not keen to use that one again. <laughs> but we ended up with uh, Routerify, which is this simple router just built on top of, again, uh, Tokyo and Hyper. Um, it was pretty decent, like the defining your routes and everything is very, very, uh, very easy to do. Uh, but we did find out that there wasn't like a lot of traction. A lot, a lot, not a lot of people were using it. Yeah. So it, it's a. It, this is what. This is not the most widely used framework, but it's it's nice and simple. It's easy to create routes. It doesn't give you the kind of errors that I was just describing. Um, so like, wasn't wasn't the most widely used project, but like a fine choice. Um, so that was the initial way that our API was coded. Um, and as a result, we had a kind of layered model. So with Routerify, it gives you a bunch of utilities for parsing the details out of the HTTP request, but you have to do a fair amount manually. And so what we ended up with was a three-layered model where we had the API layer, which was all the Routerify-specific stuff, where we're parsing the details of the HTTP request. The service layer is all the business logic, has our actual structs that we care about, and methods and things like that. And then the database layer, for obvious reasons. Um, and the API layer looked a bit like this, where you have a lot of just parsing logic, where all it's doing is like taking stuff out of the headers, taking stuff out of the path, taking stuff out of the request body, calling the service layer, and then serializing it back to JSON. And so this is what the like create notebook handler looked like. And it's a lot of manual deserialization. And this is what the update notebook handler looked like. And as you can see, it's almost entirely the same with the word re create replaced with update. And like we just had that for absolutely everything. And so as a result, it, this, this three layer thing was a real pain to work with because anytime we needed to add a new feature, we had to add it 
in three different places in three different slightly different ways. And it really felt like the API layer was not serving us very well because it just was this manual serialization, deserialization stuff. Um, so features became tedious. So at some point, Axum was announced, and we were like, oh, sweet, let's, you know, new framework, let's check it out. Always got to be wary of new frameworks, but like worth, worth looking into. Uh, so it was released July of last year and had some exciting things going for it. So some of the things that were similar to the other ones we mentioned, it's built on Tokyo and Hyper. Hyper is the HTTP library that a lot of, a lot of things are built on. Um, it has WebSocket support. Um, it's easy to write route handlers. We'll, we'll show you what that looks like. And it's developed by the Tokyo team. So, so the warp, one of the warp maintainers is also on the Tokyo team. Um, but I think he, was, he developed warp and then was like, ah, maybe this is not the best solution for this. Uh, but Axum seems like it's got a lot more emphasis behind it from that team. And so it feels like more of a part of the Tokyo stack. So we were excited about it. And we figured, let's, let's give this a try. So every month we have a, a, dem, a hack day on Friday where anybody, everybody can hack on whatever they want and show it off at the end of the day. And so switching to Axum started as a hack day project where the two of us were like, let's just see if we can do it in a day. Took a little bit more than a day. Um, it, the, porting the actual API service took about two days for 20,000 or so lines of code. Uh, and then porting the tests took another four days to get that working. Um, but the experience was, was quite good. So right now we'll, we'll go through what, like how Axum works and a little, show you a little bit of what it looks like to use it. Um, so one of, the, one of the main things that Axum has, which some other frameworks have as well, but it's got this extractor pattern. Um, and so what that means is it has these tuple structs, which I'll, I'll show you an example of in a second, that wrap your, your data structure that you actually care about. And those things take care of the serialization, deserialization for you. Um, yeah, I'll skip over that point. And so then, yeah, the deserialization is, is triggered by the web framework. So this is an extractor. Um, so here we have our, our notebook create thing. And this is sort of skipping that whole API layer that we had before. Because what we're actually using here is the, the core data structures that we have in our, in our service layer. And all we have to do is we have our handler function, our notebook create function, and we wrap the parameters to this function in a path extractor or a JSON extractor for the body. There's other ones for headers and things like that. And so that just, the function that I'm actually writing is a pretty simple function that takes Rust structs, not an HTTP request, notably. Um, and then I don't have to think about the serialization and deserialization. And the web framework, when it calls this handler function, it will call the respective methods to parse the details out of the request and so forth, which is really, really nice. It's like, it's, there's a lot of cleverness baked into this. And so I'm trying to like express how cool I think it is with this extractor thing where what it's showing you is just, you have these tuple structs that wrap your thing and, and this is just destructuring those in your function, so yeah. That's the extractor model. Um, yeah, and uh, other way around, it's it's sort of the same, but then you have to implement this into a response trait, um, where you can basically just return anything from your your function. Which, if it implements this into a uh, response trait, it will take care of yeah turning into a response. But this also has uh, oh yeah this is the oh sorry wrong button. Um, so this is what it looks like. It's just you're returning a JSON object uh, and then wrapping it like that. So super straightforward. Uh, but it also means that unit testing is super trivial because instead of yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, instead of um, uh, having to like call your function and having to do your deserialization based on what is being returned, you can just do this directly on a struct itself. So. Here, here you can see that this notebook create is returning a JSON object again, or sorry, yeah, uh, tuple. Uh, um, and it's, uh, but we're extracting that notebook from it. And that is just whatever you put in there, like whatever struct you put in there. So you can just do like an assert on notebook equal, notebook title equals whatever. And you don't have to do anything with deserialization within your tests. Um, but 
obviously, you, know, you want to use like the, um, the question mark operator and uh, stuff like that. So we have um, what you would commonly probably use is um, wrapping it in this JSON result, which is returning another API error, which also implements this into uh, response. So if an error were to occur, like um, uh, the database returns, um, yeah, object not found, you can translate it into a 404, for example, um, by just uh, implementing that into the into response for that API error. Um, yeah. yeah. So this is a little bit of how Axum works. We'll have questions afterwards if anybody has questions about that. Um, but we'll also go through some things that we don't love about Axum. So first one. Yeah. So this is one that we came across while yeah moving or refactoring. So we had like a URL which had multiple uh, path parameters in there. So we figured just define two path parameters, like one being ID, one being secret. All right. Now we created a unit test which um, filled in those parameters. Everything was passing, so we were everything's like fine. But when we found out when we actually ran uh, ran it on production, uh, we got like some weird errors. Turns out that these path parameters they don't work if there's multiple of them. So you need to have them as a tuple like this. So these are the things that you. you um, that, that the framework does, or, or rather, the framework errors out on you, um, but your unit tests are passing fine. But so integration tests are still important to have, where you just spin up your entire server, make all your requests, and see if everything's working. Yeah. Another thing that sort of a love-hate relationship with, I guess, is the way that Axum handles shared state is with this idea of an extension. And so an extension is you the way you pass it to one of your handler functions is similar to those extractors that are extracting the details from the HTTP request. It's extracting the shared state that you have from the sort of the HTTP request. Um, and that's sort of fine in the handlers. What's not amazing and what I, we come, we've come to expect from Rust is things being, if something's required, it should be required at compile time, not at runtime. With this extension, if you, for, if you code it incorrectly and don't pass your database to your, your router, you just get runtime errors. And so you'll get HTTP errors that say like internal server error instead of it giving you a compiler warning, which is not great because the only way that that would happen is just some really bad coding bug. So it would be nice if that if that was expressed through the type system. That has, I understand why they didn't do that, because then you'd have a ton of generics everywhere, but this is something that's, yeah, don't love. Yeah, this is some something which might change in the future, like it's early days, obviously, but like some sort of like in, uh, open API integration, like we use open API to define our, our routes and our models and everything. Um, so that if somebody wanted to use Ro Ruby or whatever, um, that would be possible or call us, but we are not going to write a client that's using Ruby because I don't think anybody here knows Ruby. Um, but yeah, some <laughs> kind of... Oh. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> so some, some type of integration where you either like extract it based on your routes and all of uh, everything that you've defined or the other way around where you generate something. Um, maybe it is something that we'll, we'll create in a hack day. I think it's coming up Friday, so. <laughs> Preview into Benno's hack day, all right. <laughs> um, so here's also a couple of Axum features that we're not using or, or not using yet. So first one is tower middleware. Oh yeah, yeah, so tower middleware. So Axum is built on top of tower, which is yet another layer, but there's already a lot of um, yeah, middleware um, created for tower. Um, such as compression, rate limiting, all of these other things that you see listed here. Um, and that's very useful to take advantage of. At the moment, we haven't de delved, in delved into it too deeply, but I definitely think there are some things that can definitely be useful there. Another thing is uh, the debug handler macro. So there's kind of a nice, um, a lot of times in, in Rust or Rust web frameworks, when you deal with traits, what you end up running into while developing is you'll get some kind of horrible compiler error that's like, this function doesn't implement this trait. And you go, or this struct doesn't implement this trait. And you're like, why not? I don't like, 
It do, and it doesn't tell you why. It just says, oh, it doesn't implement this. So it doesn't, doesn't work. And you get these like really not nice errors. So they, they have, a, the, um, Axum has a debug handler um, macro, which you can decorate your handler functions with. And then it'll give you this nice error that tells you exactly what's wrong with it. So haven't used that yet, but seems kind of neat. Actually, we should move that because I, I used it yesterday and turns turns out that we, uh, well, it's super useful because yeah, the, the, the error that you get back is super non-descriptive. Um, and then yeah, just adding that one, it was like this type is not, does not implement the certain serialization. So. All perfect. right, never mind. Yeah. we are using it. Only problem is that you need to get like a crate for it, which is a bit annoying, but otherwise <laughs> perfect. Uh, Bruce, uh, resources is another thing which is in there. Um, which is um, pretty useful for um, forcing, I guess, like your, your patterns, like um, uh, an index needs to uh, be like the slash and then, uh, but we also um, uh, organize everything by module. So this way it's like very easy to uh, separate everything out. And, but we are still defining all the routes in like one single big file. So this makes it very easy to get all of that logic to that single module. Um, could be pretty useful. Yeah. So in, in conclusion, Axum is still a pretty new web framework. There's, there's some rough edges for sure, uh, but it's really promising. And we, we had a good experience switching to it. We've, we've enjoyed building features on top of it since then. So would recommend a look. Uh, and for us, it's really nice that it's part of the Tokyo stack because that just means it'll likely be quite well maintained and also see quite a bit of adoption because there's a lot of people using all the different parts of the Tokyo stack and this just fits into it super nicely. So it's also worth, worth mentioning, like if you're looking at different Rust web frameworks, you should definitely do your homework and look at some of the other examples like Actix web looks pretty interesting. It's, it's quite widely used. It tops the synthetic benchmark uh, charts, which, you know, l large ongoing debate about how useful those are, but uh, take that as you will. Um, and then Poem has kind of an interesting take, and they've also got an, the open API integration as well, which which would be nice, but it was a little bit too early when, when we were looking at it to really seriously consider. So to end, I will just say that we are really, really big fans of the Tokyo stack. We kind of couldn't do what we're doing without it. And I just want to give a little bit of love to the Tokyo team just for like the really awesome way that they've gone about the building up the layers from scratch. And so they just have so many useful layers of functionality ranging from a, like bytes to tracing, which is a like distributed logging framework that's really nice to use, Mio, Tower, Tokyo, the whole async stack, and then this framework builds, builds on top of that really nicely. So just love the way that they build all of these layers that, that integrate with one another quite nicely, but are also really useful independent of the other ones on top of it. So lots of love to the Tokyo team. Um, and yeah, thanks everybody for listening and hope you have questions. <laughs>
Thank you. Yeah. I have a quick, uh, a quick question. Um, the way the framework works reminds me a bit of, I would say, Java Spring. So it's um, okay. Uh, if you were to talk to a normal architect manager, how would you sell uh, a Rust-based framework hmm. versus the old staple of uh, Spring? And actually. Uh, or would you, or, or would you actually leverage the fact that hey, it's basically like Spring, so it's not that big of a mental mental leap. So, and so, what what are the other like uh, super advantages that mm. make it make it absolutely a default choice to, to not go with Spring? Which I would really love to have these in my in my pocket. Well, there's there's less uh, XML, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's gone. Okay, <laughs> caught up in it. No, no, yeah, it's. Um, I want to say like like it's it's a bit lower level. It's not very define all your things in. Well, I, I assume that XML, but that's I guess changed. Um, and yeah, I, I'm definitely not the right person to to speak to like the Java stack or, or Spring, but like I think the first first choice is more about like programming language than about about web framework and like. I think there are a bunch of reasons to choose Rust for new projects, and and um, I would probably not want to be behind trying to rewrite a big Java service in Rust. But uh, just because it's you know rewriting anything is really complicated, and you sort of miss out on all of the nuance that you built up over the years. So like, I would be wary of a big rewrite. Um, writing in Rust is a super has been a really nice experience. It's got strong type system. It's also quite low level. So I think the things I'd reach for it for first are um, if you were just like purely building a web service, that's like a team choice. What it, what's everybody most comfortable in kind of question. Um, I think some of the areas where Rust really shines so far, um, building command line tools, Rust is a really, really nice command line tool library called Clap. That's a a great thing. Anything related to WebAssembly, Rust is really like the choice of language for WebAssembly stuff. Um, and then a lot of lower level things where you really need the performance and Java doesn't doesn't cut it, then Rust is a great choice for that. Beyond that, I think you're kind of in like, what do, what do people love using? What do people prefer? And I think there are a bunch of reasons why Rust has topped the developer, like what's it, the developer happiness survey for a lot of years. like. I think there are good reasons for that. It's also, frankly, pretty hyped. So there's some of that too. Yeah, I have a question about this extractor structs. So like, uh, do you have ability to customize them if you have some unusual like way of serializing, deserializing and stuff? Yeah. So, so how to test it? Um, how how to test? So the, the question of serializers, deserializers. Yeah. How to tell? Um, so you can. Do you want to answer that, or should I? Yeah. Um, Oops, I've got, I guess you just see my background for now. Um, uh, how do you test that? So with the extractor pattern, what it, the way it works is that anything that implements from request can be as a parameter in one of your handler functions. And so there are a bunch of built-in extractors, like the JSON one that we showed or the path one. Those just implement it from very specific types. Um, but you can also just implement your own thing that implements from request. And so if you wanted to parse XML or like any other kind of, of input things, you could implement that trait on a custom struct and then it would work just fine. Um, and then you would just want to write your test framework to, to handle that. But by default, it just derives the implementation of this trait. Sort of. like there, So um, the way that those extractors work is it's a a tuple struct that just is a simple wrapper around anything. It's generic over anything that implements Surday's deserialized trait. So anything that implements deserialized, which you can derive that for, you can wrap in and say, this is going to be put in as JSON. And then it just works out of the box. If you wanted a different thing, yeah. Okay, good. Yes. Behind you. Yeah. Oh, or next. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this is a small question in between. Where can I get the Ferris sticker like that? 
<laughs> I think we have some of them there. Okay, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> hey, uh, what's the HTTP2 tree support like in the framework? Or does it exist? Um, I don't actually know. I, so the question was, what's the HTTP3 support? Um, or, or even two. <laughs> so two definitely supported because so the way that this stack works is hyper is the one that actually implements those protocols um, and so there is support for HTTP one and two in that I would guess that they're they're working on it or ha have worked on it but I'm a I actually am not sure um, but but it's a good question the thing I like about the way just to speak to like the the thing I like about Tokyo's layering in this sense is that be, Axum doesn't actually have to support HTTP3 by itself because it's built on Hyper, which is used by a lot of different web frameworks. And so that's where actually the HTTP implementations would live. And I think there's something very nice about that because that HTTP implementation can be shared across a lot of different higher level frameworks. And then they just take advantage of that instead of having to roll it themselves. Um, but yeah, I would be so willing to bet that if it, if HTTP3 support isn't already implemented, there's like a big issue with a lot of people focusing on it or someone's got like a draft PR uh, for it. But don't know. Good question. <laughs> yeah, so I had one simple question. Actually, three smaller questions and one bigger question. Oh, wow. Um, the bigger question, I hope you can answer it. So you showed a bit about a debug handle uh, derived macro. Do you have any idea how it works? How how <laughs> make those <laughs> errors nicer? Because it's ob obviously a macro, but what code does it generate? To yeah, I've I've not looked into it, but it's definitely like an interesting one. But I would assume like that they don't do this by default because it yeah. definitely adds some like overhead or something. Yeah. Um, but I'm guessing just like uh, yeah, a lot of stuff around it um, to make sure that the that it's just like trying to see if every like parameter that goes in or goes out, yeah, uh, yeah uh, has like a certain trait. Um, you know. uh, I have no question. idea, but I hope you'll give a talk on it at a future <laughs> uh, future <laughs> Rust meetup. Or the short answer, magic. Yeah, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> uh, the other question. So uh, you're using the web sorry, uh, web so web sockets. Um, how do you handle deserialization and serialization in the web sockets? Do you send uh, bin code and code? packets over there? Um, does the framework handle this for you? So yeah, the the, the framework's pretty like loose, like Axum that is. Um, it basically delegates this to another create called Tung Tungastonite, I think it's called. Um, Tungstenite. Yeah. Tungstenite, yeah. Um, so basically you, you just get like these events, like the text binary and all the other things like the ping pong and you can just respond to them as you want. Um, we're uh, we're using JSON ourselves, so, it's, yeah. so everything is like an, an enum, and it just gets serialized or deserialized based on that oh. enum. Um, so it's pretty trivial like that, but um, the uh, Axum is pretty hands-off in that. It's yeah. just a very simple one, um, yeah, one line that just kicks off a, a loop and then you just start on your own, basically. And the final question, uh, so is you didn't talk one? about performance. I think, no, the big one was the first one. That was what I really wanted to know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what's performance like with Axum um, compared to Axix Web, for example? Is it harder? <laughs> Universal. No, um, yeah, we, we, I don't think we've done we, any we, like, like benchmarking or anything like that. Or anything but that you know of, a hand, ballpark estimate. The, uh, I don't know. They, they on, on the project page, it says it doesn't have benchmarks yet as, as comparing that. Um, it is a relatively thin layer on top of Hyper and there are benchmarks for Hyper. So I think that's like a more, like you can kind of treat it as, as just a thin layer on, on top. That's like, it's Hyper plus a bit of serialization, deserialization and not much more. Okay, thanks. Yeah.